Welcome to the Maricopa Surgeons Bulletin Brief from the Frontline Surgeons Voices. Today, I have with me two colorectal surgeons, Drs. Emily Finlayson from the University of California, San Francisco, and Nicole Sauer from the University of Pennsylvania, both of whom have become rather acclaimed because of their interest and work that they've done in frailty in surgery. Welcome, Dr. Finlayson and Dr. Sauer. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Appreciate your both being here with us. So as we've progressed uh, through our careers, we, we periodically heard new things that have come into vogue that weren't previously there. Prehabilitation is a word that's crept in quite a bit lately. We all knew rehabilitation, now there's prehabilitation. And another word that has come into our vernacular with increasing frequency and, and therefore given us pause to pause and realize its importance is frailty. Both of you ladies have established yourselves with significant expertise in this area, which, which I'd like you to share with our listening and viewing audience. So perhaps we start with Dr. Finlayson and say, tell us a little bit exactly what is frailty? Sure. Um, you know, frailty is really, uh, there's many definitions of frailty, many frailty indices, but really the bottom line is it's an accumulation of characteristics or deficits that puts an individual at increased risk to uh, not being resilient to, to physiologic stressors. So it's that uh, je ne sais quoi beyond, you know, cardiopulmonary risk, um, other sort of hard medical comorbidities that put a patient at risk for not being able to withstand stressors, whether that's a medical diagnosis or a surgical diagnosis. Um, and, you know, I think it's a lot of people are intimidated by frailty. There's a million indices that have eponymous names. And I always say the frailty index that's the most important is the one that you can actually implement. Um, and I'm a big fan of indices that don't require special equipment, don't require lab value, something that can be implemented in your office. Um, and it doesn't have to be the perfect frailty index, uh, but it needs to be the one that identifies these sort of vulnerabilities so you know what you're dealing with. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Dr. Sauer, could you tell us about whichever is your preferred frailty index and, and how you implement it in your practice? Yeah, so um, as uh, Dr. Finlayson mentioned, there are uh, numerous different tools and it can become very overwhelming to determine which ones to use. I try to break it down into the different metrics that we're trying to evaluate. And I think it's really crucial to do some sort of measure of mobility. So I like the timed up and go. Um, in the pre-op study, they showed that an abnormal timed up and go um, was as effective at determining post-operative complications as the comprehensive geriatric assessment. Um, I also appreciate the work that Jones did, which was published um, in JAMA Surgery a number of years ago, looking at just the simple question of number of falls and found that falls were correlated with post-operative complications. And then I think it's really important to evaluate cognition um, just because of course we know that there is some level of cognitive impairment that's not necessarily recognized by the patient or the family. And then that can correlate with post-operative delirium, which can be very upsetting, especially if you don't know the baseline cognitive impairment. Um, in the GoSafe study, which is hopefully gonna be published soon, um, they, we actually found that 2% of patients had a self-reported cognitive impairment, but when we looked at an abnormal mini-cog, it was 20% of patients. And so I think we're missing a, a good amount of these patients. So I think some sort of measure of mobility, some sort of measure of cognition, of course, looking at nutrition as we often do in surgery. These are the kind of main tenants that I would focus on in my practice. Thanks, and before I turn back to Dr. Finlayson, you mentioned the GoSafe study, uh, but in case people are not familiar with it, could, could you perhaps give us a little outline of that study? Yes, of course. So this is a study that was led by my co-fellow, Isako Montroni, and stands for Geriatric Oncology Surgical Assessment and Functional Recovery After Surgery. Um, that's the um, acronym. And basically, it's the first study of its kind to look at on a multi-center international study to look at functional recovery and quality of life after major cancer surgery. So those results are forthcoming, both looking at quality of life and functional recovery. But as um, a side benefit, we were able to use 
many different frailty tools to show that they're both accessible in a practice of everyday patients and also to show the differences, which was also very interesting because in some frailty tools, we found that about 20% of the cohort was identified as frail according to those metrics, but in others, it was up to 60% of the cohort. So we can see a wide variation as well. Thank, thanks very much and certainly uh, appreciated the opportunity from you and your co-fellow in my department, uh, Dr. Montroni, to participate in that study. Looking forward to seeing it uh, successfully impressed. Uh, Dr. Finlayson, so realizing um, the things that we're looking for that may not be obvious, I mean, the, the order of magnitude increase in cognitive impairment, for example, strikes me as, as major. How do we react to this information and, and what can we do to optimize the, the chance or maybe not chance, but optimize the likelihood of, of a successful outcome given what we find with frailty assessment? Yeah, and I think you really need to approach frailty, you know, not just in terms of prehabilitation, but as thinking about the whole surgical pathway. And if you think about these individual deficits that people are accumulating, what is sort of your multi-pronged approach to mitigating this risk? Um, so, for example, if you, you know, if you under, uncover some cognitive impairment, there may be some, you know, slight opportunity to maybe, you know, figure out that, that there's some drugs that may be, need, need to be stopped before surgery. But really, as Nicole pointed out, um, you know, really flagging this person as A, uh, not being able to fully participate in surgical decision making and, be, and the importance of uh, having a designate to help them make that decision because they are not fully cognitively intact and B, they're gonna be at increased risk for delirium. So making sure you have some delirium pathways in, in place at your hospital to help mitigate that risk. These are proven to de significantly decrease rates of delirium in at-risk patients. And then finally, recognizing this patient may not have the ability to go home safely and to proactively uh, make that care transition um, process more successful by engaging family and community support. So that's just one aspect of frailty that a, we need to screen for, and B, have a multi-pronged approach to help this patient do well after surgery. And so I could go down the line with mobility and nutrition and social support and, and uh, polypharmacy, you know, really drilling down on these different uh, sort of elements of frailty where you need to have this multi-pronged pre-op, peri-op, post-op care transitions approach. And when you look at these various facets, it sounds like what we just touched upon one might involve case management, nursing, and, and, and like what we do with rectal cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, it's, it's multidisciplinary. So um, what would you tell somebody, and we can stay with you for a moment, uh, Dr. Finlayson, what would you tell somebody are the requisite, who would you tell somebody are the requisite members of their team to have a successful initiative in, in um, assessment and, and proactive management of frailty? That's a great question. And I think it really needs to be tailored to the environment that you're in, because there may be you know, a, a large center that has a, you know, access to in the moment PT referrals or OT or geriatricians or uh, you know, pharmacists and social workers that can step in. But if you have a small rural hospital with limited, um, limited uh, access to these, um, these resources, it can be very challenging. In addition, Marshalling all these resources, especially if you're trying to do prehabilitation in that limited time before surgery can be especially challenging. Um, and I'll point to um, the OptiSurge study that's being done through the uh, Cancer Alliance, which has developed a toolkit that sort of hangs off of the, the Edmonton Frail Scale, which is a, sh a short screener, uh, doesn't require any special equipment that can identify different facets, and then sort of a menu of things that you can do. So if you have geriatricians available and someone has cognitive impairment, certainly try to pull that person into the team. Uh, but if not, re you know, marshal your primary care providers or whoever's available in your community. So really the need to sort of tailor your team, recognizing there are these specific domains that are gonna need to be addressed and looking around doing sort of some deep dive into your environment and figuring out who can supply support. That's in the preoperative space. In the perioperative space, this is really gonna be a nurse driven initiative. So a lot of these sort of low tech a high impact interventions around mobility and nutrition and um, delirium prevention are, are simple things that require a culture change in the hospital, but aren't require a ton of resources. Okay, thanks. So you, you mentioned resources and you mentioned some differences in environment from a tertiary academic center in an urban area such as yours or, or, or Dr. Sowers to a rural hospital. 
So let me transition to Dr. Sauer and ask, what are some of the challenges to implementation, successful implementation of, of such a program and, and how can people best overcome those challenges? Yeah, I think the main challenge is infrastructure and just not appreciating that maybe some places do have some of these resources that are just not designated exactly for geriatric patients. Um, and so I think the first step that I would recommend is a needs assessment and sort of inventory of what is available at your institution. Um, I think the other main um, barrier is a uh, lack of geriatricians in a lot of places. We have um, a lack of geriatricians finishing training and a lot of places um, have a real shortage. And so I think that, you know, getting creative with telehealth, um, using these frailty scores and kind of coming up with a more prescriptive algorithm of how to use these um, more sparse resources, I think is something that we can look to in the future. Um, if, if people have geriatrics expertise available at their hospital, then I think, you know, getting those people to be in the perioperative space is a lot easier, but I think unfortunately some places are not as lucky. And so using resources that are available, um, I think is really important. Thanks very much. Um, were you at the University of Pennsylvania able to translate your efforts to other campuses within the, the Penn Health system? Yeah, so we're actually working on that now. We have um, we have geriatrics kind of focused at one hospital, which is what we do uh, with trauma at Penn. And of course, in trauma, that makes sense. In geriatrics, we need to expand. And so we're working on expanding geriatrics to all of the hospitals and having a presence. And one way that we've been able to start doing that is through more of a telehealth model, where we have nurse practitioners with a geriatric expertise at all the sites. And then in the more complex patients, we have a geriatrics consult. And we're hoping that by using that, we'll be able to prove that we need geriatrics presence at all the hospitals. Um, but we do, we struggle with the same thing, which is a, a lack of resources in a lot of these cases. Thank you. And, and Dr. Finlayson, uh, are there any resources you would recommend to surgeons who are not familiar with the program that we're discussing this morning, uh, a reference that they could uh, seek? It's a really great time to get started with the geriatric surgery program in your institution because the American College of Surgeons has, has stood up a geriatric verification program and has released a handbook that has really the core standards in geriatric surgery. It's a great place to get started. So you can download it off the internet. It's a PDF. Really the core values are around supporting nutrition, cognition, delirium prevention, um, mobility and goals of care alignment. And these are really, you know, after four years of a deep dive into what's important with geriatric surgery, bringing together 50 uh, stakeholders from around the country, doing iterative alpha and beta pilots, seeing what's valid and what's feasible um, and, and running it through rural hospitals, large centers, urban, uh, and figuring out what's the core and what needs to be done in geriatric surgery. So this can really be used as a springboard to figuring out where you can start with quality improvement in your hospital. Um, and it's gonna take, like Dr. Sauer said, a deep dive into your own institution to figure out what resources are available uh, and what you can bring to play to make these uh, standards uh, practical in your hospital. And I found that it's really, it's not hard to get people around the table with geriatric surgery. Uh, because everybody has a mother, a father, a sister who has a story. Um, and so part of selling this is uh, telling the story, but also sort of bringing the numbers behind it and saying, these are, these are patients that are very expensive for the hospital. And how can we be proactive, not just bringing the best care to these patients, but bringing them into the hospital, having them be well prepared, having a short length of stay, preventing readmission, and really having a win-win for the hospital and for these patients. Well, thanks very much. That's excellent information. And, and I definitely encourage everyone to look at the information on, on the geriatric program. You preempted a little of what I was going to ask Dr. Sauer as a, as a final question, which is uh, how is she going to present to her C-suite folks? Uh, what is her logic for why they should participate in another uh, quality program in the American College of Surgeons? Because obviously there's the COC and the NABPC and and the NAPRC, and of course, Dr. Schulman at Penn was just the most recent chair of the COC. So there's lots of programs. You mentioned the COT. Um, so now you're going to have to go and uh, you can get Dr. Levin to help you out. But, but how are you going to petition your folks at, at Penn to 
participate in the new geriatrics program. Yeah, so the great news is, is a lot of the, the metrics that we're excited about and that our patients are excited about also save money, as Dr. Finlayson mentioned. And so we actually laid out in a recent publication in Diseases in Colon and Rectum, how to make a business case to start a geriatric program. And basically, the, the short answer is, is that you see what the volume is, you see where the opportunities are for improvement, including length of stay, readmissions, and we know that complications are very expensive and that that's a, a good way to sort of get on the same page with um, improvement of care for patients and also um, saving money from a business perspective. And so those are the places that one would start if they wanted to make a business case. Fantastic. Well, thanks to both of you for the work you've done and thanks for your time today. Looking forward to seeing the success of, of the new ACS geriatrics program. Great, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks so much. Stay well. Maybe one day we'll get to see each other in person again. <laughs> Same day. <Hope> so. <laughs>